welcome back to Normandy. Today I'm going to take you to the Carn Canal Bridge, better known as Pegasus Bridge, which ranks alongside Saint-Nazaire and Bruneval as one of the most daring raids of World War II. Pegasus Bridge is located on the eastern flank of the D-Day landing operation, behind Sword Beach. If we look in detail at the eastern flank, we can clearly see two prominent water obstacles highlighted here. The Khan Canal is a substantial water obstacle spanning over 100 metres in some sections. There are, however, two prominent existing bridges over the two obstacles, one of which is the Beneval Bridge, now known as Pegasus Bridge. These bridges are vital, the only crossing points north of Khan, and when you consider the fragile beachhead at Sword Beach is merely miles away to the north, German armoured counterattacks could cross the river and strike the beachhead. Therefore, the bridges had to be secured. The hope for this channel is to raise charitable funds for veteran charities. You can help by liking this video, subscribing to the channel, or by contributing on Patreon. Here we have an overview of Pegasus Bridge, with one of the planned landing zones right next to the bridge and the Germans defending it. Gliders were chosen to get the troops as close to the objective as possible, and to prevent the dispersal of troops which can happen when parachuting, especially at night time. The same location from above shows you the landing locations of each of the three gliders. The first glider, Glider 91, was flown by Staff Sergeant Jim Woolwick. Glider 92 landed next, and Glider 93 landed some 60 seconds later, breaking apart on impact, throwing men and equipment into a nearby pond. It was later declared to be the greatest feat of flying during World War II by the Air Chief Marshal Lee Mallory. The man in charge of the operation was Major John Howard of the Oxenbucks Light Infantry. The drill when you come into land is you link arms with the man either side of you, in my case it was Dem Brothers, the platoon commander, now on one side, and you do a butcher's grip with your fingers, you lift, it, lift your legs and you just pray to God your number isn't up, and that's all you can do, you're entirely in the hands of those Clyde pilots. Right, link your arms! Brace yourselves! At 0.16 hours on D-Day, the first Allied glider had landed. Jim Woolwork, the pilot, was thrown through the cockpit and landed in front of the glider, thus becoming the first Allied soldier on the ground. This is the second marker, where Glider 93 broke up on landing. Soldiers were thrown from the wreckage and into the pond. Unfortunately, Lance Corporal Fred Greenall drowned, becoming the first Allied fatality on D-Day. Now as we walk around the site here, we just walked past marker number one, we're just approaching marker number two now, and behind that you can see the pond, and unfortunately this is where soldiers were thrown out of the wreckage and into that pond and usually what would happen and certainly happened uh, at Pegasus Bridge was that the soldiers were not unconscious or they were certainly dazed and concussed and unfortunately if you're laden with all of your military equipment you've taken a bang to the head and you land in that pond uh, chances are you're going to drown unfortunately 
So when you look at the pictures of the wreck gliders, it's absolutely boggling to me that these are classed as successful landings, but they are. And often soldiers were injured in the landings. So let's look at the glider in slightly more detail then. So the Airspeed Horser was a British troop carrying glider capable of carrying up to 28 soldiers. It was described as the most wooden aircraft ever built with even the controls in the cockpit being made of wood. The gliders would arrive in packs and they'd have to be assembled on the airfield before some lucky pilot would have to test fly them. So once all of the gliders had landed and the men had been assembled, they ran up this slope to assault the bridge. This gun was sighted to defend the bridge and was subsequently captured during the operation. In later years, you can see John Howard here as he came back to the bridge to visit with his family. So once they had silenced the pillbox on this side of the bridge and secured the home back, Howard ordered his men to seize the far bank. Firing from the hip, they made their way across the bridge. Over the bridge! <laughs> Lieutenant Den Brotheridge and 25 platoon led the way. He ran down this side of the bridge in their assault on the far bank. Bill Gray recalled how when he got to the far bank he cleared a German position and when he got outside he saw a body laying next to a cafe. He realised straight away that it was Lieutenant Den Brotheridge. He'd been mortally wounded shot through the neck. Unfortunately, Brotheridge became the first Allied soldier to be killed by enemy action on D-Day. All in less than 15 minutes. It's only a matter of time before they counterattack. So now they had captured both sides of the bridge, as well as capturing the second bridge, all they had to do was hold these bridges until relieved. Unfortunately, this was in the face of German counterattacks. But the position was spread out across three sites, with the Germans on all sides, and they were desperate to retake the bridges. The task of relieving John Howard and his men lay with Number 3 Commando, commanded by the Lord Lovett. They would land on Sword Beach at approximately 0730, and famously, at the head of the number three commando column was Piper Bill Millen. Do you sometimes wonder how you did survive there, why you weren't shot at? Well, we had captured two snipers later, and through the interpreter, we asked them why they didn't shoot at the paper walking in the front. And one of them said, because we thought he was doom cough. He was mad. <laughs> well, if I was mad, love it was more mad than I was, I suppose. You must I play for us it. again. You must yes, recreate some history right. for us, Bill. Bill, I'll leave it to you. I okay. know that you've got to get the pipe working. <laughs>
Now with the development of larger shipping, the demand to widen the canal grew. And at first, Pegasus Bridge was actually extended, but then it had to be replaced completely in the 1960s when the canal was widened once more. They replaced the bridge with a similar cradle type design and the original was moved to the museum nearby. Still carrying the scars of battle, there's an energy about this bridge that bore witness to one of the most daring, but most importantly, one of the most successful raids of World War II. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like and subscribe for more content and help me grow this channel. Until next time.